Game Changer by Rocco Jarman. Part Zero Interface. If curiosity is the father of discovery, tolerance is its mother. Chapter One Games and Play. One of the first key principles I want to introduce has to be expectation management. To that end, there are a few technical concepts raised here, like quantum annealing, metaphors, optimization, equilibrium, entropy, and probability. During my writing process, my wife was my reluctant proofreader. She's a clever woman, but quantum annealing and entropy are not exactly her wheelhouse, and she made me rewrite until she could listen to it while sitting on her exercise bike in the morning and understand what it is that I was saying. So there are technical terms, but they are simplified, and the value of properly understanding them in general life, and especially in the context of this book, is significantly greater than the sum of its parts. Also, the effort to understand them is far less than that return. And really, they will help present an understanding of games and play in ways we are hi- which are highly relevant and which we tend to easily overlook. If we are to change the game, we need to first really understand games and play. What are we doing here? What game exactly are we aiming to change? Games are defined in part at least by their objectives. The primary objectives for this book and everything it is saying are understanding and experience. The one you can strive for and you can be terribly mistaken about. The other you achieve wonderfully regardless of whether you are completely mistaken in your understanding or not. Paradoxically, the more mistaken you are about understanding, the more intense the experience is likely to be, which means both intense delight and intense suffering. And given enough understanding, the intense suffering is optional. Really stop and take that in for a moment. This actually beautifully encapsulates all of human history without undervaluing any of it. Put in your mind frame the idea of understanding and experience being the two objectives of the game of life. Not just a single human life, but all of life. If we're prepared to play with that idea, we can truly change the game itself. This is what this book is saying, from cover to cover in several dozen ways. If we improve our understanding, we exponentially improve our experience. Tolerance. Experience is the sole interface we have to life and the natural world. It is the interface we have even to our own inner world. Throughout human history, we have relied on the metaphor of a hero and the related metaphors of the hero's journey to make sense of this. The entire concept of the hero's journey, first coined by Joseph Campbell, can be encapsulated in one word. Tolerance. The archetypal relevance of the hero's journey was the trope of the central character leaving the safety and comfort of the tribe or village or kingdom to face a trial, sometimes personified as an adversary or monster. The outcome, of course, being to survive the ordeal and return triumphantly with a prize or trophy as well as wisdom, from which not only the hero benefited, but the tribe or village could now benefit from as well. The premise is that everything that is known and understood, that is integrated into the self or the village, is what is ordered. What is successfully integrated lends itself to actualization. What this means is that civilization itself is a function of the attempt to skillfully order all of human interaction with each other and with nature. How effective that ordering is translates into the success and longevity of the civilization. Everything else that is not ordered, that is, which is not integrated, we label as chaos or darkness or other. We order things by language and concepts, and we confirm our ordering through experience. Until we arrive at an understanding, the natural world and even our own subconscious behavior can seem unfathomable or dangerously chaotic. 
Carl Jung referred to this as the shadow. Our myths may since have been relegated to the realm of fictional entertainment, but the psychological consequences are with us still. Everything we do not understand we regard as prudent to fear. To want to tame a frightened dog, you have to endure a few nips and snarls. If you retaliate in kind, you only confirm the dog's assumption in return that you represent danger, injury or loss. Connection and trust is brokered by vulnerability to risk, not control. Our default and normalized response is recoil, denial or control. These of course do not and cannot lead to true understanding, just as they cannot yield authentic experience. When we avoid something or attempt to control or contain something, we do not experience its truth, we experience our truth. And what is unknown and undiscovered remains unknown and undiscovered. The interface we configure to experience great understanding and apply understanding to and glean understanding from our experience to experience something truly and fully is tolerance. Tolerance is the amount by which we allow things to not match our expectations. It is a kind of leadership by which we forestall our own fears of death, pain and loss, which are invariably triggered in vulnerable encounters with what is new or undiscovered, with what is not yet understood. Our instincts to treat all fear as equal to danger, to regard all pain equal to injury, to typecast all discomfort equal to loss, is what robs us of the potential to discover the true nature of something new, even something new in oneself. To defy this unconscious instinct, and to do so from a place of love, is the only way we can forge real connection. Tolerance is the necessary courage component of curiosity in action. The power of metaphor. There is nothing like a great metaphor to broker a great shift in understanding. Metaphor is the gateway to understanding. But experience is the gateway to experience. The only way, in fact, to arrive at new understanding is via metaphor. You cannot send the key in an unlocked box. To understand something, to integrate it into one's own predictive model of the world, is to have a frame of reference for it. If you are rummaging around in a sack for a specific object, you cannot differentiate it from all the other objects without first understanding something of the shape you are trying to identify. Words are metaphors for the objects or concepts they relate to. Symbols are metaphors. Metaphors are the only way we can comprehend new things about the world and ourselves. There can be no other way. We can only ever commit something new to our existing predictive model by having a frame of reference, a means by which to orientate that new thing to ourselves and what we already know about the world. Even to draw a picture to explain something is to use a two-dimensional diagram as a metaphor for the ob object or concept being depicted. This can be made clear by turning and looking in the other direction too. The reason Zen has always been so idiosyncratically complex to explain is because it is pointing, ostensibly, to a no-thing, which therefore cannot be pointed to. To attempt to grasp after it, like we would a concept or an idea, is to fail to connect with it, like trying to pick a bar of soap up in a bath. That was a metaphor, but one in which we can notice it saying more about what it feels like to not be able to grasp something more than it did about the soap. The metaphor only worked because it pointed at grasping, not at Zen. The tradition of Zen, in fact, has a rich body of koans, unsolvable riddles, which are not only unsolvable, they are not meant to be solved and have no definitive solution. They are not designed to peddle or broker understanding. Their purpose, by design, is to confound the typical apparatus for understanding and classification to such a point that a something of consequence can be noticed about the illusory nature of mind and therefore suggest a property of awareness 
that preceded and is independent of the thinking mind. And of course, something in this context is not ever going to be the adequate word. For almost everything else, though, we have metaphors. Almost. There is one other key exception. And to help us understand that exception, where metaphor cannot help us in our discovery of the world, we shall use, you guessed it, a metaphor, namely quantum annealing. We can understand what quantum annealing in turn means by yet another metaphor. That is, sometimes we have to throw our hat over the fence to force ourselves to climb over and go and fetch it before we know anything about the circumstances on the far side. The internet tells us quantum annealing is quote, an optimization process for finding the global minimum of a given objective function over a given set of candidate solutions by a process using quantum fluctuations, end quote. If the mention of anything quantum-related triggers you into thinking we are about to wade into deep technical waters, in the immortal words of Douglas Adams, don't panic. It is true that the first reading of this technical definition of quantum annealing tells us almost nothing. But what we understand what quantum annealing is in the context of what it tries to achieve, we are able to perfectly understand. To come at this a little more gently, we might just consider what normal annealing means without the quantum bit. Annealing is what we do to a metal blade or glass, for example, to make them stronger by making them less brittle. The word strong can be misleading here too. The best way to understand what we mean by strength in this context is in how strong a sword might need to be if we wanted to use it as a lever to lift or move a heavy object like an anvil, as in a strong sword would bend and not break, rather than taking strength to refer to the force applied with our muscles to lift the lever. If we wedge the tip of the sword under the anvil and try to tip the anvil over, a weak sword would be unable to bend some and would snap as soon as too much force was applied. In this context, a strong sword would be the one that bent without breaking. Some steels are made deliberately to have the quality, and some are made not to. A nail file, for example, is brittle. Fencing wire is what we call pliable. To get this property from our sword, the right grade of steel is not enough. We need to anneal the blade. This is done by heating it up in the forging process, just enough to allow the molecules to realign themselves without phase change that is, without melting it right down to liquid form, and thereby destroying the thing we are trying to forge in the first place. When making a sword, one would want it not only to be sharp, but also to be able to be sharpened, and also to hold an edge. We want it to be firm enough to cut or chop the object we swing it at, but not so firm that it shatters under the impact of the blow. Annealing gets the molecules to line up, not unlike strands of a cable, giving the blade strength and flexibility without compromising on integrity. Now this happens to be just about as perfect a metaphor for the project of personal and societal development that is being suggested as you could imagine. Flexibility is a key and fundamental aspect to versatility and resilience. Annealing is therefore a metaphor of chosen and deliberate stress to optimize flexibility without yielding integrity. To really get this concept to land, it helps to understand why a brittle blade would snap or shatter in the first place. The reason for this is that everything in this universe is always trying to find its lowest sustainable energy state. If the sword cannot bend and a large amount of energy is applied as force to move the anvil, if the anvil does not move, all the force applied has to go somewhere. If the blade cannot bend, it will break. Just before we get back to quantum annealing, let us take a quick detour to understand entropy and equilibrium and the relationship they share. The universe is what we call a closed system. The word closed refers to the fact that no energy can leave it or no new energy can be added to it. We do not have to understand how big or complicated the universe actually is. We only need to accept that if we try and get an idea of everything that exists, 
it falls under this magic umbrella of that word, universe. In a closed system, energy is available for use, until it isn't. It does get used up, because it cannot disappear, but it can become so scattered that it is not available in any meaningful sense. The design of our universe seems cleverly arranged at every scale from the incredibly large to the inconceivably small to be frugal with its energy. Everything seems to work and interact in a way that prefers to rest than do anything. This might not seem obvious when we think of volcanoes erupting or tides crashing into cliffs, stars exploding or even our sun burning fiercely for millions of years. But all the forces and moving parts that result in volcanic eruptions, the seeming endless heaving of tides, and even the orbits of planets, are due to things that are, as they are, choosing by some elegant design the path of least resistance. If we place a ball at the top of a slope, it will roll down and come to rest once the momentum has been expended. Before we set the ball rolling on its way, its mass and the gradient of the slope represent what we call potential energy. This means until it gets that first nudge, the ball will stay exactly where it is. But tip it just onto the lip of the ramp and gravity will do the rest. The gravity of the earth means the ball wants to roll down the slope. And when it hits level ground at the bottom, it will roll on a bit until the friction will cause it to stop. The same force that got the ball rolling down the slope is the same force that will cause it to stop. The thing is, the ball and that tempting slope still represent a kind of potential energy. But unless we can get the ball back up the slope, it will happily rest there until the end of time. And that is what we mean when we talk about equilibrium. The universe is built out of slopes. And not all slopes are visible in exactly the same way, but they can always be described as gradients of some kind. Eventually, however, in a closed system, with nothing or no one to rearrange balls and slopes, all the balls will roll down every available slope. This is more or less what we mean when we talk about entropy. To round back on quantum annealing, even at the scale of the very, very small, we can observe this aspect of the universe at work, with all the mysterious parts and forces that quantum physicists get out of bed for in the morning. Quantum annealing is what happens at this scale of the very small, in simplest terms, where systems apply heuristics to determine the lowest energy state at which a system can rest. Heavy things roll down hills until they come to rest. Hot things cool down over time. Everything is leaning towards equilibrium. Things with mass are pulled towards gravity until they come to rest. If pressure builds, it wants to find a way out. If something is up, it wants to find a way down. It is the reason volcanoes erupt, and the same reason rivers flow to the sea. The generic name we have given this kind of problem is optimization. Optimization basically says, we may not know the right way, but we are going to keep assuming a better way exists, and we are going to keep trying to find it. Another way of saying optimization is constantly seeking the global minimum. Why this is relevant is that all progress, all evolution, all improvements we can think of, all the innovations that stick are the ones that optimize the relationship between favorable outcome and the energy spent to achieve it, alongside our consideration of how much of value we stand to lose in that transaction. This might not be obvious, but that is the definition of our pursuit of happiness and the reason underneath why we do most things in this world and the basic formula by which we attribute meaning to effort, loss and suffering. Here is an example of how we rationalize our relationships between cost or effort on the one side and reward or benefit on the other. In other words, how we might attach meaning to suffering. Let us say you had a lung condition, the circumstances of which meant that while you could handle the thin oxygen at high altitudes for short periods of time, the thing that would prolong your life meaningfully would be living at lower altitudes. In other words, 
you can handle the climb out of the valley you are in, even over the near peak, in the hopes or expectations that the valley you reach beyond is closer to sea level. The problem, of course, is that from here, you have no way of knowing what the altitude of the valley beyond will be, not until you have taken the risk of climbing the peak that stands in the way. As with our previous exploration of looking at the lowest possible resting state, it would be in our interest to find the valley floor with the lowest altitude and live out the rest of our days there. The obvious problem is that we cannot be sure which direction to go, which peak to climb. From here, we know nothing of relevance about there, and we cannot keep climbing peaks forever. Here, metaphor does nothing useful. In fact, it unhelpfully provides the potential of both outcomes, like Schrodinger's cat, in which the far valley has equal chance of being at higher altitude and at lower altitude than the one we are in. There is no way of knowing for sure. But at the quantum level, things work in a way that is better described as probabilistic, and not entirely the way we think of as directly related to cause and effect. At a quantum level, a phenomenon called quantum tunneling occurs, and the optimal, that is the global minimum, can be determined by a kind of scouting over the hill into the next valley and moving there if it is, in fact, a lower altitude than this one. We will much later get back to this, but for now, let us go back to the much less strange concept of quantum annealing. Quantum annealing says there is a natural landscape of peaks and valleys and we cannot control the landscape, but we can exploit the landscape we find. In other words, we cannot be certain of the right or only way. But if we are to ever find the best way, we need to evaluate the options and map out something about the landscape of opportunity and, and challenge to determine if not the direction to move, but at least inform the merit of trying. If we know more about what is probable, we can make more informed guesses. In the example of our hunting for the lower altitude valley, if we know lower valleys exist, an insignificant number, it suddenly becomes worth the risk to leave this one. Once we know what our chances are, it's more a case of statistics and less one of pure chance. Plus, once we get there, we can improve the accuracy of our mapping and reevaluate accordingly. Metaphors are ways in which we can apply the knowledge and understanding of something we already know, either our relationship to it or its relationship to the world, and use this to triangulate in on an understanding of a new thing. When the thing we are trying to understand is beyond the veil of our reach, if we have no ready frame of reference, there is this other approach, this heuristic of trying something, because in the absence of certainty, an informed risk is worth the gamble. It is the principle of play. In the absence of knowing something for sure, the choices are either do nothing or gamble. And if we are smart, we do not test in prod, meaning we do not gamble everything real time. We test as many variations of our intended gambles as we have the means to. To reduce the blunt risk of not knowing, the best heuristic is play. And play is when we try something that we think might be right and we test the boundaries and limits of what we are prepared to gamble, attached as much, if not more, to the benefit of learning to improve than of being right every time. It is a way we can simulate the conditions of failure without losing our opportunity to keep playing. Games are our way to effectively simulate experience to enhance understanding, without incurring the full brunt of what the cost might be if the experience were raw rather than simulated. Games are the ultimate metaphor because they are an expression and an instantiation of the metaphor of life in a way we can interact with it. Games are a simulation of specific aspects of life and creation. The beauty of a game is we can start over, we can get a redo, we can try approaches, we can get a sense of attainment and achievement which is non-trivial. This is not because we confuse the game for real life but because games, however virtual, contain real challenges and real problems, and we have to apply ourselves in very real ways to overcome them. As with the metaphors of annealing, games can be a way of seeing how far we can temper our properties 
where adversity is a given. We ask, how far can I bend and adapt? Being that how resilient we are to challenge and disruption is a question then of how much we have subjected ourselves to intentional and controlled stresses. Similarly, as per the metaphor of quantum manili, games can be ways for us to experiment with risk-taking in simulated models so that we can learn something about optimization and risk-taking in the real world where uncertainty is always a given. This is exactly what the function of simulated models are as used by meteorologists to predict the weather. They take what is and what could happen given the known and unknown variables and feed it into a virtual simulation of our atmosphere. Then they tweak everything according to our degree of certainty around what is known and then ask a computer to model out hundreds if not thousands of what-if scenarios. In the end, our biggest fears are not about adversity. Humans tend to enjoy adversity provided it has limits. It is uncertainty that frightens us. And the definition of uncertainty is the potential of adversity, the limits of which might exceed our own. And games are our way of setting up controlled models of life, controlled not to remove adversity, but to limit it. We would never enjoy a game that had no adversity in it, because the fact of human nature is the reason we love challenge is because we love a reward. And we often attribute more meaning to the reward by the amount of adversity we overcame to achieve it than the actual objective size of the reward. This is why trophies exist. Trophies are the metaphors of our trials and triumph and the meaning we attach to them. A good game is one that draws the player in where the <clears throat> levers of human incentive are skillfully pulled in ways where the boundary between actual and virtual has been crossed and the player is engrossed in such a way they do not notice. In fact, to get the full value from a game at times, the act of objective reframing is counterproductive. A key attribute of value to certain games is the immersive nature to the players, which allows more realistic emulation of the aspect of life being modeled in the game. The more immersed the player is, the more passionate and determined they might be, and therefore the more invested they are, and therefore the more meaningful anything that can be taken away in terms of learning, discovery, attainment, defeat, or triumph. Saying to oneself, this is just a game, can impair the level of immersion and therefore the value of the game. To be too stoically indifferent about a game is to risk the impairment of passionate engagement. Once the player is drawn into that game, that is, once the investment becomes personal and the abstraction ceases to be abstract, we make it non-trivial by our engagement. In this way, games are excellent at revealing truths which exist outside the context of the game. Not the simple precise truth of, but the truth about. We devise our games to have parallels to aspects of life, survival, human interaction, and problems of every conceivable nature. These might be related to anything from pattern recognition motor skills, behavioral science, motivation, game theory, and incentives or strategies of cooperation and competition, or even strategies for optimization of resources. This is also why it is good that games end. If we do not time box our games, they become so immersive, the ways in which they are initially and uniquely useful become redundant. The usefulness of a game is in our treating it it treating it as an analogue for an aspect of life. If we get lost in the game, it is no different to being lost in life, and there is no review of experience we might leverage for the increase of understanding. If the game is too immersive by nature, if it does not have a hard stop, and the cycles keep perpetuating and drawing us in, our next best hope is mindfulness. This ability to meta-play the game, to watch ourselves playing the game, and break it up in our own logical increments, and to remind ourselves from time to time that while we might not be able to stop any time we want, even so, ultimately, this is still just a game. This stance deals the metaphor part we discovered. The other part, the part where metaphor is no good, the example of what we explored around quantum annealing, around the prudence of working with probabilities, this is where we run a model 
of what might be true to see how it plays out. In other words, we play. This is what a working hypothesis is. It is constructive play.